we're going to move to the first agenda item here. Adoption of ordinance number 786, proposed surface water management fees. This will be our finance director, Eric Christensen, and our public works director, Maya Andrews. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, the purpose of this portion of the presentation is to review the surface water management surface charges and to adopt ordinance number 786. In accordance with the city's financial policies, staff is remitting an, an annual increase to this to this uh, surface water management or swim service charges by 5.5% to adjust for inflation. Next slide, please. The proposed increase is based on the consumer price index U from June 2020 to June 2021. The 2022 swim fees for the different classes are presented within the summary section of the agenda bill and represented on the slide in table form. You can see the description type, the year, this year's fee, 2022's fee and the dollar amount change of the increase. For residential, the annual increase is $9.64, and that breaks down around 80 cents a month. Next slide, please. Showing the 22 revenue pie chart, you can see that the swim fees are the primary revenue source for the surface water management fund that accounts for the maintenance and improvements of the city storm drainage system. Per governmental accounting standards, this fund is considered a business type activity. Thus, cost must be recovered with fees similar to a private business. Since these fees are the primary revenue source, it is important to adjust the fees on an annual basis to help keep up with inflation and to keep the revenue from losing purchasing power. Inflation tends to erode the purchasing power of money over time. This recommendation complies with the city's financial policies the city's financial policies provide a solid foundation for making financial decisions and help ensure good financial management. We want to highlight that the financial policies assisted with the upgrade in the city's bond rating from AA2 to AA1. At this time, I'll hand off the presentation to Public Works Director Maya Andrews, who will provide additional details regarding the use of resources. Good evening. So I will start with um, telling you a little bit about what the swim, we call it the swim budget, the stormwater management budget, what the swim budget includes. So it has both two components operating in capital and the capital program, um, the funds in that program are used to fund small projects, fully fund smaller projects. And then it provides required grant matches for larger, larger projects. We can't uh, fully fund large projects, but we are able to leverage funds using uh, our money and applying for grants. Many grants require that we have matches. So it's really important to um, be sure we have those matches available so we can get grants. Um, on the next slide, you'll see some of the recent projects we've been doing. Um, these are ones, uh, well, Mosier Park, of course, is still underway, but uh, those other ones are ones that are in progress or done. Um, the important thing about this slide is those first four projects and many of the projects we do are what I would say are necessary. They're not optional projects. Those are necessary to prevent damage to the public or to public or private property um, that is caused by the city's stormwater system. So we have to do those things because it's our system that could potentially cause some damage or damage our own roads um, if we don't repair it. The last two projects on the list are the only optional projects, but those two projects also are important because they provide significant water quality and environmental benefits to Miller Creek. Um, the Mosier project also, of course, allows us to make uh, improvements to the sports fields and sports field and the restroom. So those are really exciting projects and important in my mind. Um, on the next slide, I'll talk to you briefly about some of the upcoming projects we have uh, early next year and are already in progress. Um, Miller Creek Enhancements, I think you're aware of, that realigns and daylights a significant portion of Miller Creek and enhances floodplains and improves water quality in the creek. And we are partnering with the city of SeaTac, the Port of Seattle, and Department of Ecology on that project. So again, we're using our, our small amount of money to leverage a lot of other people's money to do this work. Um, the South 140th Street Stormwater Trunkline Project 
that's necessary to support development in the Nira vicinity. That pro without that project, we can't continue to develop up there. We uh, it, the the developments underway right now rely on that trunk line being in place. So that's uh, in my mind another necessary uh, project if we want development to continue. And then 20th Avenue South is a pipe replacement project. This is um, a very old, very uh, not in good shape pipe. Um, it's failing in multiple places and it's again necessary uh, to prevent future damage to public or private property. So all good projects, all really important projects. Um, so now I'm gonna move on to the operating budget. And some of the things that you'll find in the operating budget include staff. So over 15 of your staff members um, are fully funded by the stormwater fund. So that's about 13% of your staff are in the stormwater fund. Um, it's also interesting to think about it, but the, the most expensive equipment and the most expensive equipment to maintain in the city of Burien is funded through the stormwater fund. And that includes that, that little monster of a truck right there, our Vactor truck, our beloved Vactor truck, that uh, like many Vactor trucks in uh, its family, needs frequent and expensive maintenance. It has been, it's been one of the more useful pieces of equipment this city I, I think has ever owned. Um, we do a lot of great work with it, but it is an expensive piece of equi equipment to, to maintain. Um, we also purchase some of our more expensive supplies in the stormwater fund. So this is where we pay for um, asphalt and aggregate, aggregates for backfilling trenches that we dig for stormwater pipe. We need to buy stormwater pipe. We need to buy catch basins and catch basin lids and grates. Many of those things are, you know, over a thousand dollars a piece. So again, a lot of expensive equipment come out of the stormwater fund. Um, we also have to use professional services for with to hire outside contractors for tasks that we don't have the capabilities of doing, or um, things like. Um, we can't vector hazardous materials. We don't have a way to, to manage it in our trucks. We have to hire outside uh, companies when we have to vector um, spills like gasoline or something out of a, a storm system. We have to hire outside companies to help us with that. Um, we also have to hire companies that help us video our pipes. Um, we do have one camera now that we just recently pur purchased. It's not a um, it's not a robot camera, so it doesn't go very far into the pipe. It's a push camera that you push in. It's a very, once again, useful piece of equipment, but we still have to use professional services for some of the more complicated pipe videoing jobs to, to find uh, issues in pipes. Uh, another expensive thing that happens in the stormwater fund is um, paying for decant or dumping services. So everything that's in that vector truck has to go to a special place where the water has time to settle out of the material so that it can be properly disposed of at a proper disposal facility. Um, and then finally, we also do debt service out of this fund for a um, project on the Ambon Pond that was done many, many years ago. Um, and that debt service will be retired in the next few years. Um, so moving along, um, what does the Stormwater Operations Group do? Uh, our maintenance team, of course, maintains over 160 miles of stormwater conveyance system and over 6,500 catch basins. So that's that's a lot of uh, a lot of things to maintain for a very small crew. Um, and our engineering team um, reviews development projects. We review utility projects that affect stormwater in the right of way. We inspect all new stormwater construction and we investigate and respond to concerns about flooding, drainage, and spills. Um, our engineers also manage the capital program, some of which we design in-house, a lot of which we design with outside consultants. And we also apply for grants and administer grants. And then finally, the biggest thing that we um, all work on in the stormwater program is our um, NPD, NPDES compliance, which is our National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permit. This is our permit uh, that we work with on the Department of Ecology. Um, so moving along, what, what does NPDES require? And here's just some of the many, many elements. It, the vast majority, this is important, the vast majority of what we do in the stormwater program relates to our NPDES permit in some way, if it's not, and, and most of it is required by our permit. So currently we're required to inspect every stormwater facility every year we have 100, more than 130 public facilities that have to be, be inspected every year. 
We also have more than 300 private facilities, which also are required to be inspected every year. So that's 430 of those. Then we inspect every public catch basin every two years. We have over 6,500 catch basins, which means we have to keep up by doing about 3,300 catch basins each year. Um, and last year, because of our staffing shortage, we, re we reduced some of our seasonal staff and others. We weren't able to make our 3,300, which means now we're trying to catch up um, and to stay up with that 6,500 inspections that we have to do. Um, we have to also re respond to any issues identified in those inspections. And so if something is, is not right in an inspection, it needs to be fixed. Uh, and that means for, for the public system, that means uh, on average, we vector 200 to 300 different locations every year as a result of those inspections. Then we prepare and submit annual reports. This is a, um, this is not a small task. Um, it's one of the more frustrating parts of the NPDES permit for me because it's a lot of paperwork and a lot of time. Um, it's a year long task. We're collecting data throughout the year and there are dozens of documentation requirements we have to respond to in this um, annual report. And it asks us lots of different statistics, things like number of erosion control inspections you did, number of enforcement actions taken, number of spills you researched, documented follow-up actions to each of the, the, the spills you did or other concerns that were identified. Um, there's a lot, lot of data that goes into the report. And then it also requires that we do uh, have an education program. That's, that's where StormFest became an important part of our annual work. Um, we're trying to get that, it wasn't, didn't happen last year. We're trying to get it up and running uh, this coming year. Um, we're required to have that program um, and it has to target specific behaviors and it has to track and document results. And this is what Paige Morris was hired to do for us. Last year, she was temporarily uh, reassigned a little bit to assist with our climate action plan. As she resumes her duties to comply with our NPDES permit, we have to start thinking about how we're gonna budget, um, budget and have staff for the implementation work that we have recommended in the climate action plan because that's gonna be some new work we wanna add in coming years. And, and we haven't done anything in, yet to budget for that. Um, so those are all the things in the current permit, but then the new permit, and this is where I, I really want you to think about this. This is These are big things coming. And I had intended to talk to you more about them next year, but some of them are already having to be done over the next year. The first one is stormwater management action planning. That is included in our budget. It's in the capital budget, and it's a um, it's a it's basically a study, and it has to be completed by March of 2023. Um, and it's basically uh, like a mini storm drainage plan. We have to prioritize our stormwater basins throughout the city, and then we pick one sub basin basically and develop a plan that addresses issues and accommodates development and protects the water quality in that basin. Uh, the requirements for that, that plan, again, it's due in March of 2023, but there's other due dates, interim due dates throughout 2022 that we have to meet. Um, they have a very specific public involvement process that they want us to do. Uh, so we'll have to comply with those requirements. Um, the good news about this program is we did receive a grant. We applied for and received a grant. And I don't know that a lot of cities uh, have done this, but we got $250,000 grant for this project. Um, but as, as with most grants, it requires a match of about $75,000. Um, this is going to take about a significant amount of staff time next year to meet that aggressive deadline. And then the second one on here is the source control program. That one's even more... Um, ominous to me or burdening at this point. We're still getting our arms around it. We've been having talks in our um, city forums about what this is gonna mean, but it's, it's a big lift. Um, we are required next year to inventory all of our pollution generated businesses. And that includes all food service businesses, all auto sales, auto maintenance, auto businesses, all gas stations, all dry cleaners, medical buildings, um, any business that manages any kind of hazardous waste or has any kind of outdoor material storage, we have to have an inventory of all of those next year. 
And beginning January 1st of 2023, we have to conduct inspections equal to 20% of the number of businesses in our inventory. And we have to, at those inspections, evaluate their operational best management practices related to their pollutants and um, work with them to make corrections if needed. This is estimated to be over 100 businesses per year. And these are longer inspections than the several hundred other inspections I talked to you about. These, these could be two to four hour inspections per visit. Um, and each one may require some documentation and, and follow up with the businesses. So we have to have the program up and running, next, you know, ready to go for January which, 2023, which means next year we're gonna be developing the program, inventorying our businesses, um, we're going to have to implement some code changes, um, and we have to have staff in place by, you know, by January 2023 to figure out how we're going to accomplish that work. Um, we also have other code changes. I didn't put on this slide next year, but uh, early in the year, we are going to have to adopt the new um, stormwater manual, the new King County stormwater manual. That's a requirement of the permit. And I can't remember if that needs to be done by April or June, somewhere by before the middle of next year. So that's going to be coming before you. When we adopt that new manual, we typically have to look at our entire code and adjust things that are related to it throughout the code to, to make it mesh well with our code. Uh, and so looking forward, the last bullet is just that it's likely we'll need an additional um, staff member in 2023, which I would bring to you in next year's budget to support the ongoing requirements. Um, so the storm drainage master plan, as you guys may recall, in uh, October of last year, we adopted an updated storm drainage master plan. And um, some of the key things that happened there, we they recommended that we um, actually increase, but have regular capital expenditures to support replacement of aging pipe system. And we've been trying to do that. That's kind of what the 20th Avenue South project is this coming year. Um, we also, it also estimated though a needed increase of 14.2% in operating budget to meet the regulatory requirements. Um, and that's exclusive of any inflation. And that, so it was in 2019, those dollars were over 3 million and it's gonna be more than that. Um, but um, we, we haven't done that yet. As you can see from the previous slide, those increases are coming. Um, so moving to the next slide, um, what does that mean for the stormwater program? So NPDES requirements are continuing to increase. It's not just our city, it's all the cities. Um, our, our regular inflation increases don't support those requirements. So we are gonna have to think about in the 2023 budget, how we begin to support the re those requirements. In the meantime, we've been keeping the budget here and that's capital and operating all in this place. And the capital budget has to shrink in order to, to deal with these increasing operating expenditures. So slowly our capital budget is kind of getting smaller because we've been trying to hold, hold steady on costs uh, during these times. Um, so this is just a quick comparison uh, of some of our neighboring cities. Um, as you can see, the rates on the ones that were readily available were all higher than ours. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't know one right now that's lower than ours. I suspect CTAX is, but I have not checked. Um, CTAX Public Works is funded quite different than other cities around them. They are um, heavily, heavily, if not fully funded through a, a parking tax, at least in past years. So, so they're a little bit unique among the cities about how they fund their work. I'm not sure what their stormwater rates are, or how that works, but uh, it's, it's not really the same comparison. Also, it should be noted, um, most of these are proposing a 2022 rate increase. So these, uh, these aren't even comparing 2022 rates. This is our 2022 rate with their 2021 rates. Um, moving on to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit more about that too. Both Shoreline and Des Moines, when I looked theirs up online, they have adopted policies knowing what's been happening with NPDES uh, to increase their swim rates regularly every year more than inflation. So the Des Moines policy is actually, it's actually a combined um, inflation factor that includes a construction factor, which is probably bumping it up a little bit more. Um, 
And then they add on top of that different percentages, like 2.7% one year and, and three point. So they're, they're making their way uh, to the NPDES requirements gradually. Uh, Shoreline actually adopted kind of a, a staged five-year plan. It was like 20% something one year, 20 something percent one year, then 10%, 10%, 5% and 5%. So they're climbing, um, trying to meet those NPDES requirements in a different way. Um, our proposed rate increase uh, is 80 cents a month. Um, a lot of cities, um, our city pays it through the property tax bill. So it's paid twice a year, but some cities charge it monthly. Um, but that's, that's the equivalent of 80 cents per month is what our increase is. Um, on the previous slides, what you can see is I, I will be talking next year about larger increases, um, which is partly why I think it's a good idea right now to, to take that step today so we're not jumping up as fast as some of the cities have had to jump up. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, we're on to back to Eric for now, but I'm happy to answer questions too as Eric wraps this up. Thank you, Maya. Uh, staff recommends approval of ordinance number 7086. It is important to note that rate, the rate adjustments and appeals are available for the city's code, including a low income senior citizen property tax exemption. Also, the city should adopt the ordinance by November 30th to meet the King County's deadline. Thank you. All right, uh, go ahead, Council Member Tossin. I move to adopt ordinance number 786, increasing the 2022 swim service charges. Second. We've got a motion by Council Vertosta, second by Deputy Mayor Marks. Uh, open for discussion. Go ahead, Council Vertosta, to speak on the motion. Uh, so I, I was convinced the other night, uh, Maya, but we uh, decided to wait till tonight to do this. And uh, you have laid out all the rationale and justification. And um, as you spoke, I thought, why aren't we thinking about that staged approach, knowing the issues that we have in our community? But I look forward to hearing the future council talk about um, those opportunities to increase the rate to meet the NPDES and all the other needs that we have in the community. So it's my rationale here. All right, any other council member or deputy mayor that would like to speak on this? Okay. Hearing no discussion, all those in favor, please uh, raise your hand or say aye. 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 My shoes off right away. <laughs> all right. So uh, the motion passes. Was, was that a unanimous vote? Was, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. That was a unanimous vote. Okay, and is is Councilmember but Councilmember Ogin is absent, so okay. he was yeah he wasn't here at the start of the yeah. meeting. Okay, cool. Thank you very much.